to the practice try thinking about what way one's going to go try thinking how what it what will it be when i die if i don't don't get through in this practice uh, where are you going to be reborn you don't know i mean Venerable Ajahn Panyavado was for 41 years the senior most Western bhikkhu following Ajahn Mun's path of practice. Ajahn Panya, as he was called, was a man of intellectual brilliance who, through his own efforts in meditation, was able to establish a strong spiritual foundation in his heart. While showing a selfless devotion to the task of presenting Ajahn Mun's Dhamma to his many disciples, his calm and purposeful presence touched the lives of so many people. He became a pioneer of the Western Sangha whose leadership influenced countless monks and lay people to practice Ajahn Mun's teachings, and whose translations and interpretations of Ajahn Mahabur's teachings introduced generations of Buddhists to the Thai forest tradition. Ajahn Panya was born Peter John Morgan of Welsh parents on the 19th of October 1925. His birth took place in Mysore state in South India at Kola Goldfields where his father was working as a mining engineer. At the age of seven, he was sent to the United Kingdom by his parents to begin his formal education. He lived with his grandparents in Wales until the rest of his family returned from India several years later. His family then settled in the English Midlands where he completed his primary education. Because of the Second World War, his family was forced to move several times before he finally completed his secondary education. In his
his mid-teens, young Peter contracted bovine tuberculosis in his right foot. He underwent several unsuccessful treatments before having the infected bone surgically removed from his foot, resulting in his ankle bones being fused together. He was not required to serve in the military during the war, and thus avoided making a lot of bad karma for himself. Peter was then free to further his education at Faraday House in London, where he graduated with a degree in electrical engineering just as the war ended. Following graduation, he spent two years in India working as an electrical engineer in the Kola Gold Mines. Upon his return to England, he continued working as an engineer for a further seven years, first in Stafford, then in London. It was during this period of his life that Peter became deeply interested in Buddhism. He began to contemplate the value and purpose of birth and life in this world in light of its inevitable march towards sickness, old age and death. He began to question the very nature of existence and concluded that popular religious and scientific explanations were seriously flawed. In his quest for the truth, he discovered that the Buddha's teaching provided a firm basis in theory and practice, which could serve as a platform for thoroughly investigating these issues. He read Buddhist doctrine extensively and joined several Buddhist organizations. Finally, inspired by the example of Bhikkhu Kapilavado, who had ordained in Thailand, Peter decided to denounce the worldly life in order to fully pursue his search for the truth, unhindered by the burden of worldly concerns. He was ordained as a seminarer at the London Buddhist Vihara on the 31st of October 1955. He was given the name Panyavado. In December of that year, Panyavado and two other seminarers flew to Bangkok, Thailand, together with Bhikkhu Kapilavado, with the intention of ordaining as bhikkhus. After staying at Wat Pak Nam with Long Po Sot for a month, on the 27th of January 1956, the three seminarers were duly ordained as bhikkhus. In mid-July of that year, they all returned to London where they settled into a small vihara provided by the English Sangha Trust. Gradually, the others all returned to lay life, leaving Bhikkhu Panyavado to look after the vihara alone. He remained in charge of the vihara for a full five years before another bhikkhu arrived to take his place. During that time, he selflessly devoted himself to the task of teaching the Dharma to the best of his ability, not only at the Vihara, but also in giving lectures and in organizing retreats. At the same time, he fulfilled his obligation to the monk's life of meditation, practicing it as thoroughly and as strictly as possible. He deeply felt the lack of a reliable mentor, a good teacher who could assure him that the noble goals of the Buddha's teaching were still attainable in the modern era. Were there any living arahants who could guide him along the path to Nibbana? If he could find such a guide, he would wholeheartedly dedicate himself to that goal. To that end, Bhikkhu Panyavado decided that he must return to Thailand and look for a good teacher, one who could command his full trust. 
He flew back to Thailand in November of 1961. At first he went to stay with Venerable Ajahn Panyananda at Hot Chola Praton near Bangkok. While there he asked a Thai friend to scout out the best, most revered meditation teachers in the country and report back to him. Eventually this friend took him to meet Venerable Ajahn Mahabur, a long-time disciple of Venerable Ajahn Mun, who was widely renowned to be an arahant. Impressed by Ajahn Mahabur's resolute character and profound wisdom, Bhikkhu Panyavada moved to his monastery Wat Pabantad in Udon Thani province and became his disciple. He arrived on the 16th of February 1963 and remained resident there for the rest of his life. Ajahn Mahabur soon shortened his name to Panya and from then on he was known simply as Ajahn Panya. He remained a close disciple of Ajahn Mahabur for the next 41 years. He said that he was able to put up with the hardships of living in the remote jungles of northeast Thailand, mainly due to the strong faith he had in Ajahn Mahabur and his teaching methods. The climate was hot and uncomfortable. The food was simple and rough. There was a language barrier to overcome. And his fused anger left him with limited mobility. But his heart was bolstered by his faith in the teacher and his perseverance in the practice. Ajahn Panya's mind tended naturally towards wisdom and that allowed him to progress quickly in meditation. With the benefit of Ajahn Mahabur's careful guidance, his understanding of Dharma deepened and became more comprehensive with each passing year. In Ajahn Mahabur's insistence, Ajahn Panya reordained into the Dhammayuta Nikaya with the present Sangharaja Sundat Pranayana Sanwara as his preceptor. He took reordination at Wat Bawaniwe on April 22nd of that year. Ajahn Panya possessed a very subtle and refined nature. His practice was beyond reproach. He was always composed and circumspect and displayed wisdom in everything he did. Not only did he develop himself to the fullest, but his exemplary life and practice influenced many people from all over the world. From the beginning, he worked tirelessly to translate Ajahn Mahabur's writings into English, publishing translations that were distributed free around the world.
Gradually, he became a source of strength and inspiration to the Buddhists from many countries who traveled to Thailand to see him. This is especially true of the Western bhikkhus who have joined the Sangha at Wat Pabantad since his arrival. He always showed a selfless devotion to the task of instructing these monks, and they always relied on him to teach them the correct way to practice Buddhism. In 1974, the English Sangha Trust invited Ajahn Mahabur to visit London, England with the intention of trying to establish a Theravada Sangha there. Ajahn Panya accompanied his teacher to London, where he helped to communicate the essence of Ajahn Mahabur's Dharma teaching to the Buddhist faithful. It was to be the last time that Ajahn Panya returned to England. But, Although no Sangha was established at that time, their inspiring presence laid the groundwork for the future English Sangha. His knowledge of engineering became a valuable asset to the monastery. From the time he arrived, he was involved in almost every building project carried out at Wat Pabantad, often designing the project and overseeing the construction himself. Ajahn Mahabua had so much faith in his wisdom and engineering skills that he really questioned Ajahn Panya's judgment in those matters. Whether the engineering was but electrical or mechanical, structural or electronic, he had mastered them all on his own initiative and could apply them with a skill and grace that constantly amazed his fellow monks. The ease with which what Pabanta developed from a simple Ajahn Panya passed away in complete stillness at 8.30 a.m. on August the 18th, 2004. He was two months shy of his 79th birthday. He died as he lived, with his heart purely and simply at peace.
Ajahn Panya's remains were cremated at Wat Papantha ten days later. His funeral ceremony was the largest event ever held there. An estimated 50,000 people attended to pay their final respects, including over 4,000 monks. Something extraordinary occurred on the day of his cremation. The sky was clear and cloudless. Yet, on three separate occasions, a circular rainbow appeared in the clear blue sky, each time encircling the sun like a large luminous halo. The rainbow first appeared as his casket was being placed on the funeral pyre. It appeared again later when his life story was being read aloud. And yet a third time when Ajahn Mahabua lit the funeral pyre. It was as though the power of his spiritual attainment had created an external visual image to reflect the depth and subtlety of his virtue for all to see. It marked a supremely graceful conclusion to the life and practice of a monk whose loving kindness and humility radiated softly from his presence to encompass the whole world of samsara. record of an historic occasion, historic for Buddhism, for Thailand where this film was made, and for England, as it depicts the founding of the first English Sangha or group of Buddhist monks ever to be ordained in Thailand and ever to exist. This group who returned to the West to England to create and develop the first Sangha in the West. This film was made at Wat Pak Nam by Sicharyan Dhompuri 
uh, in Thailand, a very famous monastery for teaching. And this scene depicts the pre-night celebrations. The central figure here, a famous teaching bhikkhu in Thailand, Chao Kun Mangalavacha Muni, Abbot of Wat Paknam Vasicharyam. Uh, he is the presiding and chief bhikkhu of this monastery and these uh, scenes are taken the night previous at what is known as Naka ceremony, pre-night. On the left here, a very famous bhikkhu, Tita Wedho bhikkhu, next to him Kapila Wadho bhikkhu, the English monk, who brought with him his juniors or novices, Samanera. The one on his right, uh, you see there, is uh, Robert Alberson from Rochdale near Manchester, the cotton industry centre in England. Um, next, on the left here, George Blake from Jamaica, uh, who's also come, and on his right, Peter Morgan, originally from Wales. All these have come. They're intensely interested in what's going on. It's completely new to them, a completely new life to them. This scene is important and interesting in the fact that it proves and shows that this actual ceremony goes back way beyond Buddhism itself. It's a facet from Indian life of many uh, thousands of years back, where the story of the world, the round of rebirth, Sangsara, as we call it, is told in traditional fashion. Here these gorgeously decorated tables in gold and lacquer are strewn with gifts from all kinds of people, gifts of robes and fans to the new bhikkhus to be and to all the group of bhikkhus who take part in the ordination. At the back you see the title fans, those decorated fans, they are for bhikkhus, every bhikkhu in Thailand has one as his authority. As the scene moves, you see the group there sitting quite happily, smoking cigarettes, everybody around quite happy, uh, everybody very friendly. Uh, at the back there, you see two Chinese bhikkhus talking now to show you how close we are here in this country with the Dhamma. And here the leader of the celebration and the ceremony brings his candle three times towards him and then wafts the uh, feeling and blessing in his heart toward the new group, uh, sending forth metta, shall we say, or loving kindness. Then the candles go all around this vast crowd, everybody sending their thoughts and blessings. All the people here you see are well-known friends of uh, Buddhism, Kapilawatu, Tita Waito. Uh, they both know them very well. Uh, many, many supporters. Everybody's a friend here. The juniors, of course, now are extremely interested. They're seeing things they've never seen before in their lives. Much the same as these Thai people are seeing something they also have never seen. Now, the celebration, of course, on the next day uh, takes place uh, with traditional procession. And... Uh, Normally, on the next day, uh, takes place uh, with traditional procession and uh, normally moves uh, off with quite a large gathering. There were thousands of, people, thousands of people present on that day. And it moves off from the new Bhikkhu Academy at Wat Pak Nam, led by a rather fearsome creature called a Naka, or fire-spitting serpent. Here you see it, followed by a band, which everybody thoroughly enjoys, uh, particularly the drummer, and another small band then followed up by... Uh, male lay supporters carrying the title fans, the ceremonial umbrellas uh, covering the various gifts as the procession moves off. Here you see a large number of Upasika, each carrying some small gift. Here's that wonderful creature again, the Naka. Everybody loves him very much. Uh, sometimes he's rather frightening because he shoots real flame out of his mouth. And these fun-making people, uh, everybody enjoys themselves very much. The wonderful part of these type people is that they have a, a great sense of fun. Uh, they love a party, each intensely concentrated, each trying to keep his mind on the task which is undertaken uh, as the procession moves uh, in toward pagoda ground. This procession will have to move round the pagoda, you see it here paused, it will move into pagoda ground and move three times round the pagoda to the right, keeping the right shoulder toward it, before the new, uh, before the novices are allowed to enter the pagoda. Now we move into the pagoda uh, proper, where the new juniors will pay salutations prior to the now you see them celebration. inside the pagoda, paying their respects respect to the memory of the Lord Buddha and to the Upachaya Chakun Mangalarajamuni Abhadavat Paknam. They will then move forward um, with uh, their robes to be presented to them as bhikkhus. Uh, here you see uh, the bhikkhu who is touching the novice. is very famous here, the Abbot of Watpo. Uh, his name is uh, Chakun Damantiloka, a bhikkhu of 40 wasa, 40 years standing. He's acting the part of first assistant Upachaya today. Okay. Here we find uh, the first assistant Damantiloka Mahatera, just turned his head. He's going to give the uh, Sikh Harpadan or precepts, which always commence with Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sambuddhasa. Praise to 
the all-enlightened one, to Siddhartha Gautama, who brought this teaching, this way of life to the world. And then the young novice repeats all this in Pali, which has meant much hard work on their part, and he repeats the precepts which commence, Panati Pata Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami I undertake the rule of training to refrain from killing or harming any living creature. He now moves forward with his begging bowl, the bowl in which he will beg his food for the rest of his time as a bhikkhu. Now we see the two assistants, Damajiloka and Kapilavato, taking their positions. When they will place the motion before the Sangha, chanting in Pali, uh, the motion, and then they move out to the three novices and commence to question them. This is a very long chant in Pali, all of which is known by the first and second assistant by heart and from memory. A chant which has to cover questioning these, testing them. Each one individually is asked a number of questions dealing with his health, his sanity, uh, his life, his purity. You will notice that they are all very concentrated, the mind very calm now, very intent on the task at hand. Any mistake is corrected immediately by the first or second assistant. These two um, are very responsible for the whole ceremony. If anything goes wrong on anyone's part, these two must know and correct it, either it be pronunciation or wording. They must know everybody's part. Both the novices, the uh, upachaya's duty, everybody's duty, these two must know and correct. It's a very responsible position on a day like this. Any mistake would mean the nullification of the ceremony and would have to be commenced again. Now you see the questioning goes on and the two assistants return now and word perfect they recite together the findings they have about these juniors. Word for word, statement by statement. Now the Samaneras move forward to outside the Sangha, they have been called and before entering they have to ask to become bhikkhus. They commence by the words Sanghang Bhante Upasampadang Ya Chama Olong Patuno Bhante Sangho Anukampang Upadaya Please, Venerable Sirs, may we enter. Will you accept us? They chant this three times, then salute right, left and centre before moving forward, and they will be again questioned by the first and second assistant, Dhammati Lokamahatera and Kapilawadhu. Here the Upachaya is giving them instruction on the bhikkhu life, telling them in Pali, a very ancient language, that from here on they beg their food, they wear only three robes, they must be satisfied with the foot of a tree for bed if necessary, and to live on the merest of medicines, to possess nothing for the rest of their time as bhikkhu. Now the first and second assistant are again uh, questioning them. You see the lips moving here, the questioning is going on. And after this, there will become the acceptance. After the Vichaya now holding his fan of office, his title, is again instructing them in a long chant in Pali, which we call Anusana, expressing everything to them, uh, trying to give them some idea of the task which they've undertaken. All the bhikkhus here present in this Sangha or group who are ordaining them are what we call Mupasana bhikkhus, meditation bhikkhus. That is bhikkhus who have undertaken this bhikkhu life to strive all the time for the enlightenment which the Lord would have gained. Here you see the juniors moving off now are bhikkhus uh, and they will bring now presents, small gifts. Salute the Upachaya Chankul Bhavanako Sol Mahatera who is now Chakul Mangalaraja Muni, his latest title. Now, something unprecedented here. The new junior bhikkhu has been instructed by the Upachaya to salute Kapilavato Bhikkhu, an English monk of only two years standing, to salute him, as were all the rest, as their teacher. A very happy moment this for the new Sangha, a very happy moment for Thailand. Everyone is very, very happy about this. Here you see the new junior bhikkhus now receiving gifts, and you'll notice that on the, on the ground they have golden cloth, uh, the purpose of which is to prevent them inadvertently touching any woman's hand. The Sangha here in Thailand, Mahasangha, the controlling group, are extremely strict, which is one of the reasons that the Dhamma is so strong in Thailand. The Bhikkhu's Winia, or code of discipline, is extremely strict. 
he who see the juniors uh, concentrated as the chant is given forth, taking them into Sangha, all the bhikkhus around them, and this very impressive and sacred moment to the heart of a Buddhist is carried out with naturally some feeling of relief on the part of the new juniors. They've been under terrific strain. And now the traditional scene, Englishmen, bhikkhus, barefoot, begging their food in Thailand on the daily round. Here you see them moving forward in order of seniority, uh, begging their food as they go, each uh, with bare foot. Each one here has to be completely concentrated in mind, practicing what we know as satipadhana or mindfulness, a form of meditation. Uh, they do not notice who is giving the food. Uh, they keep their minds on the food. Uh, they keep their mind on the reason for begging the food is not for enjoyment or sensual pleasure, not to make the body strong or fat, but just so that this life, this bhikkhu life, may be led uh, to strive for enlightenment. Every movement, every feeling, uh, every act has to be registered by them. It is their discipline that their concentration must not break. Now they move across past the pagoda uh, on their way back to their actual vihara, and here again we find some more people uh, wishing to give them food. As they move nearer their place of residence, Rebirth and reincarnation. Is there a difference? Really speaking, it isn't rebirth. It's birth dependent on. In other words, birth dependent on the previous karma, the Yes, that's true. But there is not something which goes from here to there. Because the, the, what, what rebirth is concerned with is the five kundas. Five Kandas. What is concerned with the five Kandas? Um, you have to have something there of the Kandas which goes on, like this. But that doesn't, nothing which will go on. Kandas die completely, all of them. But the Chitta doesn't die. The Chitta doesn't, it doesn't, isn't involved in re rebirth in the sense that it's reborn. Mm. It isn't, it's just a continuum. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the thing is, the book, because of how we are, we don't see that. And because of how we are, when when we come to time of death, there's a terrific wanting to live. Mm -hmm. So grasp, and we grasp another life. And the grasping comes from the from the uh, chaitanya, mm -hmm. which is um, so sort of set up by the kilesas, by, by, also by the kamma. Kamma, that person, makes them want to live. And making them want to live involves the kilesas. Must be the kilesas. And so they, they grasp. And um, as all the um, practicing because uh, they're not afraid of death, they're afraid of their birth. Because they don't know where they can go. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's a chitta that grasps another five kandas? It's in the go. chitta, yes. It's the work, working of the chitta. Okay. Uh, associated with kamma and the kilesas. Okay. So you, you don't actually call it a soul? This person is... Yes, what, can, what arises from that is something new. But the, the kandas, the kilesas go on. And the kandas go on. Mm. The factors of the chitta. So whatever kilesas that you may have managed to... Well, they survive. Redu reduce or subdue, you would carry on to the, to the next birth? 
they carry on, but you never know because chelation, uh, because the 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 kama that one has, it can go and jump to any any place of kama where there's kama. It hasn't 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 actually come to fruition, and it can go. It can be become a immediately from the previous environment or from a um, thousand years ago. We just don't know. We have to develop the panel. Seeing the body's part of it. Also seeing the nature the change can go Is that what you were saying yesterday about uh, just allowing the chitta to, to be free and come up with its own? Yes, one must. Yes, yes. But it's that, that the, you have to have a certain amount of samadhi to, to get there, to allow that. Um, no, what is the, the, what's necessary is you must have enough samadhi to prevent the uh, whirling thoughts go mm. cause trouble. They, they, they need to be stopped really. But um, uh, to see the chitta like that is if one, if one leaves it free, it'll go to where it's necessary. Where it's automatic. It automatically goes in the right place. If one tries to do it for oneself, it usually it goes all wrong. <coughs> because the self has cascilases involved with it. And the the aim of this, I mean seeing the body change into an old body like that, it shows up the impermanence of everything in each other. And this is one of the things that's very important. So, so is that just something that would happen to anyone if they're getting to a certain level of samadhi or is it certain personalities or certain people well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a typical, it's typical, but it doesn't happen the same way for everyone. It's the sort of thing that happens. And to see it like that is, is very valuable. Very. When it's seen like that, it goes in quite deep too, because, because one hasn't tried to do it, it's come up automatically, so it's a fair and a fair of the chitta, it, it, it goes into the chitta. Also, you can see how this, this sort of thing, when one sees like that, it shows up the hollowness of the world. It shows up. The hollowness yeah. of the world. Are the whole world's empty. Yeah. There's nothing really substantial in it at all. It's all just coming and going. So when you say from there to go on to develop Panya, you then... Well, that is Panya. When one, when one starts thinking like that, that is the panya, panya. But one mustn't think that Samadhi and Panya have got two distinct, there's a boundary there where yes. it turns. It isn't like that. Yeah. The Samadhi and the Panya, in fact the, the skill is to have the Samadhi and the Panya there together. And if one can do that, that, that works very well. Really, really I was reading the um, Ajahn Man Ot the biography, um, just a couple of pages at the beginning, it said that he had powers to communicate with the with the Deva realm and the Naga realm and, oh, yes. and the spirit realm. Yes. Is that a very unusual um, ability, or would, would most people who became enlightened have that? Um. I don't really know, but I, I, I would guess that um, the more majority of who can like me, I'd say you'd get about, um, oh, what, 
fifty percent may have been able to do that. Right. Mm. The reason I asked is because we have this lady called uh, Mother Mahavira in Melbourne. Yes. She um she's a association called the Internet Wisdom mm. Society. Yes. Which is a branch in, in the US. Yes. And um, we often talk to that. The Naga realm and the Deva realm and what goes on. Oh yes. yes. And um, yes. and She's very believable in the way she yes, talks yes, about it. Yes. She lives yes, a very, very simple life and um, yes. she looks like she lives 10-3 tenths at least. Yes. Um, and she's curious. Yes, she is. Uh, um, quite, quite a lot of people like that can, can contact the day as much fuel can get up to the Brahma realm, the higher realms, yeah. But as a whole lot one has to realize it's all samsara. It's all samsara, it's all impermanent, changing. The chitta. The, the trouble with the word soul is that nobody knows what it means. Yes, but in, in, the, in the Christian sense, soul is a, is a permanent entity, isn't it? I think so. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's not, not the way in Buddhism. The chitta is one of the five hundred. No. Not the five kandas. The five kandas are all connected with the world. Chitta is not. Chitta doesn't die. And Chitta is the, the fundamental, really, you can say, uh, the pure Chitta is fundamentally what we should all be. That's the Arahant. Pure Chitta. So what happens at, at the Death of an um, it, it, it's something which nobody can say. There's no concept because the nature of uh, samsara is, is impermanence. Everything is impermanent. There's nothing static at all. And impermanence means that you can't find any real thing because there's nothing that remains. Even for a moment, it's all changing. Whereas Nibbana is, is not impermanent. How can you say it's permanent? Both don't apply. They, all the categories don't apply to Nibbana. And because of that, what happens to the Arahant after death is something that's completely beyond the world. It's, the world can't understand. But it's, it's, um, it's something that uh, the people who get there, they say, of course, it must be like that. There's no other way. This is, it's the truth. it is, it's the one who knows. It can only go by its characteristics. And it's the one who knows all the time. Knowing is the nature of the chitta. But it doesn't mean to say one always knows rightly. One only knows rightly if one's got purity. <coughs> um, but to the, but to the nature of knowing, the chitta, when when Vijnana is presented with an object, then the chitta joins up and becomes Vijnana. Vijnana, I take it, means 
uh, dualistic, goes dualistic because it means we is to, to divide and jnana, divide and knowing. <laughs> this means the chitta becomes two, the objects and the subjects. And because it's that nature, that and it's impermanent, this is in Sankara. It means and it has to come up again, and it needs to disappear again, again, again. All things are uh, changing all the time. But when it, when it reverts back to the chitta, the pure chitta, then that change they doesn't take place like that. So in, in, in the Satipatthana, when you do Chitkana Pasana, hmm. Is that what is arising in the chitta? Is that in the chitta? Is that in the chitta? Oh, well, I must understand the uh, Satipatthana. The whole of that, in fact, the whole of the teaching of the Buddha is method. It's a method of uh, leading to Nibbana. And the, the, the whole of the teaching of the Buddha is not Lokutra. It's not beyond the world. Because to go beyond the world is to go what, what, beyond what people in the world understand. So it should be no use. And so the Buddha was clever and he, he, he saw that you've got to give them, give people, something they can work on, something they can really do. And so he taught the, the uh, doctrine of uh, having the view, with a view, and that view is the view of, it's the right view leading to Nibbana. But it's not, one knows, you must never think that, the doc, that the, what the Buddha taught is absolutely true. It's not absolute. The absolute you can't say anything about. It's way beyond. <laughs> Like the nature, the Arahant say, the, the nature of the pure chitta is emptiness. Meaning, it's empty, empty of all this, empty of the world. But what's empty of the world, we can't imagine what it is. We don't know. It goes beyond. And the purpose is to get beyond, and it's, it's as though they say that they're telling us. That is what we should all be. That's the right state. This state we're in now is, is muddled up and sort of caught up with all sorts of wrong things, wrong ways. We all have the pure chip that is clouded by the dependent plant. No, we can't call it the pure chip then, because there's not two chips. If you have the pure chitta and the defiled chitta, you have to have two. You can't be like that. The, the defiled chitta is the one that does all the work with the world and sort of messing about, as most people do. But when you when you destroy the kilesas, that chitta goes pure. Right. And it's easy to do the same. Yes. So it happens. But pure chitta doesn't exist uh, separately yeah. at all. When I get close to the theme of Nibbana, uh, it's difficult to it gets difficult to, to work with it because what we used to is a world where words have logical meaning. It becomes difficult to get me on the air because it's very, it makes you want to empty it, empty the world. And because it's empty the world, um, the, uh, 
got nothing to pin on at all. I think what freedom means, or complete freedom, it means no limit, no boundaries, um, nothing as you, you can't be or can be. Really. It, it, it's something you can't imagine. Really, the whole of that, the only way is to get there. If one can. It's hard work. Yes. What, what is it that... Is it just laziness or... or, or it's kilesis. It's the It's the kilesis. The it's the kilesis. And the kilesis are set up mm -hmm. by Kamna. It's, it's a sort of uh, vicious circle. So we, we get kilesis, and kilesis, um, uh, because kilesis are there, they give rise to bad karma. Because it's a bad karma, that increases the kilesis. So it's going around all the time. And the, the aim is to break them. have a great desire that you're almost battling against your own. Yes, the, the thing is that you've got to uh, see this. We've all got to try and uh, let go of our attachments. The attachments are the thing that hold us. And the attachments come from wanting. And those uh, attachments keep, keep going on and on and keep us going. And we see that the, the uh, nature of feeling is very important. Feeling is a result from karma. Feeling is not karma in itself. It's a result. Pleasant, unpleasant. Hmm? Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Mm -hmm. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Present. 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 Oh, present and unpleasant. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, although the feelings are all, they're all, they're all it's infinite variety. Yes. But there's those that are sort of grace, the major divisions. And feeling is very important, but it's the result of the past. Uh, but because of that result, when this when unpleasant feeling comes up from bad karma, there is a tendency to react with trying to stop the feeling mm. and turn it into a bad feeling. But because of that, one, one then has a desire to stop it. So one does things based on greed or hate or delusion. Is trying to stop that feeling, and that that reaction is karma. That's karma that people make. And that karma, if they go that way, tends to produce the future situation almost exactly like it came up here, came up in the first place. In other words, the the, 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 the um, feeling arose because of bad karma. What I've, what I've often had done in the past. And, and the, the camera gives rise to a reaction which makes them do something very similar to what one did in the past. So it goes on and on often getting worse. So it's mindfulness to prevent the feeling? Uh, you, you, not to prevent the feeling, no. To prevent that reaction. The reaction is the important yes. Mindfulness can, can watch the feeling, be aware, aware of it. It comes rather to, uh, what one has to say is, one looks inside. When, if for instance, a feeling of anger starts to come up, feeling that the blue is dry 
Then, if one's trained oneself, one has a sort of red flag that comes up inside. Like a red flag that comes up, warning flag. And then one, one stops and looks at the thing. But isn't the anger in itself also a, a negative karma? No, if one looks at the feeling, the feeling's not negative karma, and the, the looking is not negative karma. The anger really only comes about when the reaction takes place. That's the anger. But we call it an angry feeling because it gives rise to that reaction. The feeling's just neutral. But it's unpleasant. It's a bit, it's neutral in the sense that it, it doesn't, doesn't actually do anything. Uh, it's we who actually react to it. We dislike it. Is that why uh, what one person labels as a pleasant, a pleasant feeling would be different to another person's um, opinion? Because it's a common... Yeah. It's very, very hard to compare feelings or in almost anything between two people. Yeah. I mean, we, we say, suppose you say that you, uh, um, something cuts you, oh, you said it's sharp, like, <laughs> like a hot iron going in. But it's not like, not like a hot iron. It's only a, an expression, a way of trying to show the other person something that he's experienced, which he can compare with what one's experiencing. And we never know whether it's the same or not. But this business of the feeling coming up and giving rise to anger, it is important. Very important because in the world it happens time after time after time. People get get uh, anger coming up, and they give way to anger. Really, the reaction is the giving way to that feeling. Instead of saying, "This feeling is my own fault. I created it, and so I must put up with the unpleasantness." If a person says like that, then. The, that comma steadily goes left, left and left. Because there's no reaction. Mm. If, you, if you watch anger, however bad it is, you still... Well, however bad that feeling is, that's, that feeling can be very bad if one's prepared to watch it and put up with it, without reacting, without giving way to any uh, expressions in speech, in thought, speech or, or action of anger. Then it, it gets, it dies away. And to that extent the come is less. It comes up again, but it won't be as strong. And if one does that uh, steadily over a period of time, that comes will die completely. Think about it, but you've got the two things, the feeling and the reaction. The reaction to it. Which is tanha. Maybe. Is it sometimes hard to differentiate the, the, the feeling going into anger? Is, is that about mindfulness? Uh, it goes in so quick. Yes. You, Normally you can't catch it, but the thing to do is, um, usually a person, if they try to do this, they, uh, they forget, and they give way to the usual reaction. But then, if they've been thinking about this, they'll suddenly realize, oh, I should have stopped it. And 
referred to, to this several times, it becomes closer and closer to time when you can catch it. Once you learn to catch it, then then one can can steadily get rid of it. Nowadays anger is the important one. But there's also greed. Greed can go in a very very similar way. Because of unpleasant feeling a person looks for something to placate the feeling. For instance, somebody feels bored and they say, Oh, I've been to the pub and have a drink of beer or something. That's, that's the same thing really. And the results are, are equally bad in their way. What do you think of neutral feeling? I, I, I read or heard somewhere that that, that arises from delusion. Mm. I, I would doubt that. I, I'm not sure. But, uh, neutral feeling is you do not even notice. Not that much. Sure. Because the body is set up in such a way that it's capable of noticing pleasant feeling and painful feeling, mainly painful. If there's neutral feeling, the mind doesn't stick on it. It doesn't give you much object to stick on. So neutral feelings are usually very weak. The, the nature of delusion is, is very difficult to overcome. Um, it's, the first way of overcoming the delusion is overcome greed and hate. Those are two two main ones that come out, uh, the strong ones. And they are the two arms of delusion, the active ones. The delusion is much more passive and it involves many things, but the very important ones are ones one learns. very young one learnt all sorts of things um, and one was in no state to criticize or to consider whether they're true or whether they're, they're right and because it was so when the mind was in a sort of yielding soft state it goes in very deep very strong and that can remain with a person throughout their life quite easily and it's, uh, there's a lot of delusion in this, in what one learns. Great deal. As he lived, with his heart purely and simply at peace. Later that morning, Ajahn Panya's body was placed in the main sala at Wat Paban Thad, 
where monks and lay people came to pay their final respects in traditional Buddhist fashion. The following day, Ajahn Punya's body was placed in a suitably dignified casket. His body lay in state in the main sala at Wat Bantad for the next eight days awaiting cremation. On the morning of August the 27th, the day before the cremation, Ajahn Panya's casket was carried from the main sala to a large meeting hall adjacent to the funeral pyre. What exists? is not real, and what is real doesn't exist. Try thinking how, what it, what will it be when I die if I don't, don't get through in this practice? Uh, where are you going to be reborn? I don't know. I mean, I think that I, I've got to overcome this. You know, these, these kilesas, stuka.
inte lag både gäng. Vi såg lag och vård flöting där han gärna gick. Vi sett hus bara vi sett that log will reach the ocean provided it doesn't get snagged up by uh, other sort of uh, weeds and other things in the water provided it doesn't sort of get caught on a sandbank uh, provided it doesn't um, go rotten and sink uh, and provided it's not taken by gods or men for use uh, if it is all this is okay then in any event in the end it'll float out into the ocean One o'clock that afternoon, Ajahn Mahabua formally addressed the large crowd of Buddhist faithful, gathered in reverence to pay their final respects. ท่านเป็นผู้ปฏิบัติดีปฏิบัติชอบเป็นดูรักธรรมรักวินัยซึ่งเป็นองค์ศาสดาของพวกเราชาวพุทธทั้งหลายธรรมและวินัยก็ได
สร้างที่นี่มาติกาปาทังปนามาเจอุสลาธรรมะอุสลาธรรมะอภิยากตาธรรมะสุขายเวทนาญาสัมปยุตาธรรมะนุกายเวทนาญาสัมปยุตาธรรมะอสุขามสุขายเวทนาญาสัมปยุตาธรรมะวิเวกะธรรมะวิปากะธรรมะธรรมะเดวะวิปากะนาวิปากะธรรมะธรรมะโอปาดินุปาณานิยาธรรมะนุปาดินุปาณานิยาธรรมะนุปาดินานุปาณานิยาธรรมะสังเกตุสังเกตุสิกาธรรมะสังเกตุสังเกตุสิกาธรรมะสังเกตุ
Ajahn Punya's funeral ceremony was the largest event ever held at Wat Papantad. An estimated 50,000 people attended to pay their final respects, including over 4,000 monks. The cremation pyre continued to burn late into the night. When the hot embers finally cooled down, the charred pieces of bone that survived the fire were collected to be distributed among the faithful as objects of worship. The extreme heat of the fire had caused the larger bone segments to break up, leaving many small, often porous fragments. Such bone fragments, often burned to an ashen white colour by the fire, are kept by Buddhists and treasured as relics. From beginning to end, Ajahn Panya's funeral marked a supremely graceful conclusion to the life and practice of a monk whose loving kindness and humility radiated softly from his presence to encompass the whole world of Sangsara. <laughs> 